Welcome to the summit, I am that you are, no one, and this. And I now have the pleasure to introduce you to Scott Kiluby. Welcome, Scott. Thank you for having me. Yeah, you're welcome. You're a non-duality teacher, you're an author, and you're also the founder of the Kiluby Center for Recovery, where you help people with addictions, with uh, depressions, anxiety, and it's based on the natural rest method, which you also have a book about. And uh, I have read your book, Living Realization, and also Reflections of the One Life. And the many books you've written and everything you're about, if you were gonna just point to what is it all about, like in one word or a phrase, what, what would you say? I guess in the simplest ways, you're pointing to the recognition of presence as your true nature, as you say, instead of the ego, your ego identity. Yeah, that's the simplest way of saying it. Yeah. So yeah. what what do you, the timeless awareness that you also mention in your books, that that's what we are. Yeah, same as when I say presence, I mean, uh, it's a different words describing the same recognition, but yes, yeah, same thing, yes. Yeah. And the ego that you say is, uh, what's that then? What is the ego? How would I define it? Uh, well, the way I would define it, it's like an energetic contraction. It's an energetic belief system. It's not, you know, part of it is the story in our minds, the past and the future that we identify with, those words and pictures in our mind, we literally identify with them. But there's also feelings and sensations that are connected to those thoughts. So the ignorance is in mistaking yourself for those things that are rising and falling on a continuous basis, especially. You know, the scene is, it's, it is mysterious, isn't it? Because it's hard to talk about, but it is a real recognition that happens where you literally see that you're not that story and you're not the emotions or the sensations, that you are what's awake. Um, but that doesn't mean that the, the, the thoughts and the feelings, sensations completely stop forever. It's just that the recognition has happened or that they don't stop completely necessarily, but the recognition that you're not those things that are rising and falling, that you are the awakeness, um, dawns on you at a certain point. That's the recognition. When you wake up out of the energetic contraction, <laughs> that you think you are the separate self. Yeah. Yeah. And then, so does something happen in that when you recognize that? For example, when it comes to uh, addiction recovery or uh, depression and, and dealing with those things, is that when you recognize that you are not all these thoughts and emotions and that ego, does that addiction fall away or depression fall away? It, it, I think everybody's experience is different. Um, certainly when I had the recognition, the recognition happened in my experience. Um, there was a big shift in my cravings around drugs and alcohol. It's just like after that shift, my body just didn't want it in the same way. Like it didn't feel compulsive towards those things. But it gets a little bit stickier than that because for many people, just having that shift isn't enough in and of itself to actually dissolve, for the addiction to dissolve away because of things like trauma, they get left over. Even after the recognition, trauma still hangs around in the body sometimes, and sometimes some unresolved issues. And so sometimes it takes a while or a little bit of inquiry after the recognition or a little bit of work after the recognition to help that fall away. But really it's hard to explain it because everybody's experience is different. I've had people wake up out of ego and they just don't, they just don't have addictions after that. <laughs> they just don't have many. But the vast majority of people have to do some work after that because of just the nature of addiction, just how much of it's entrenched in our consciousness and that it's such a habit. So, but yes, it can fall away. It can fall away either again suddenly or gradually through the, the, the embodiment part of this work, which is where you bring awareness all the way down to the body because the body is where it's holding a lot of the trauma that's driving addiction or the shame or so there has to be some work deeper work than just the recognition of uh that you're not your mind or you're 
sometimes the momentum of that continues. In other words, the uh, addictive cycle, the uh, deficiency stories, the stuff that drives it. It's still kind of, it's like a bicycle wheel. The recognition kind of puts your hand on the bicycle wheel that's going like this. So it starts to slow it down, but there's still a momentum to it, I guess. It's one way of saying the, the wheel still spins for a while and you have to kind of deal with that. Some people do. Yeah. Yeah, it, because you also speak about the core deficiency and the wound. And so maybe that's, um, it's so ingrained in us. So it's not just like that, to, <laughs> you know, make it dissolve just like that. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So when, so what do you do with that? Like, okay, now I recognize I'm not my thoughts, my sensations, my emotions. I mean, I am that is happening and, but it's just temporary and it comes and goes. And so it's like, yeah, there's no person there really. It's just what appears and dissolves and appears and dissolves. And so, yeah, you recognize that there is no ego there. That person I thought I was, was uh, illusionary. But yet all these uncomfortable emotions come up like the wheel you talk about and it's it, and it's like ah it hurts or oh and yeah so what do you do with that you you just sit with it or you just uh, observe it and and then in that in by just doing that it goes away on its own with time or what what do you do so we have a process of inquiry, the Killaby inquiries, which are like a really skillful way to help you see that when a pattern arises or a feeling arises that it's not you, they're like tools that help you see it. And why would you need tools? Well, because not everything is conscious, first of all. So there's a lot of stories and beliefs and feelings and sensations that are repressed in people that are that are driving addiction, but people aren't actually connected to, they don't even know what they are. So some of the inquiries that we do actually bring the unconscious into awareness, like unconscious memories of something uncomfortable that really uncomfortable or scary that happened when you were a kid or a feeling about yourself that you don't even know that you have or a belief about yourself or about the world or about other people. Like unconscious things do not just arise and fall to awareness. Even after an awakening, sometimes they remain unconscious. So the inquiries are about bringing, making those things conscious. And then once they're conscious, yeah, you just allow them. And in allowing them just to be as they are, you they fall away, they dissolve. So one of the points of inquiry is to bring the unconscious, make it conscious. But the other is that inquiry has a way of dismantling things. So like when a feeling comes through and you're feeling it and you're having these thoughts of obsessing on a, uh, a drug or alcohol or something, um, the inquiry... The inquiries have a way of like showing you the difference between a thought and a feeling or a thought and a sensation. So it allows you to sort of let the thought fall away and then go deeper into the feeling as its own thing, like come into the feeling in the body, explore it a little bit to find out, is there anything unconscious there or how can we dismantle, how to dismantle literally the craving when it arises. The dismantling just means not just resting and allowing it because Sometimes when you're resting and allowing it, it feels so strong that it still pulls you in. Mm. So it, the inquiry takes away its strength like by, by deconstructing what we call the Velcro effect. The Velcro effect is the thoughts connected to the feelings and sensations. So the inquiries are like your best friend after a recognition in a way because they're just so powerfully of, allow you to let go of these things as they arise for sure. Now, some people can just rest and allow but what I've learned through the years is, again, um, when that stuff comes through, sometimes it's so strong that they won't be arresting with it. It just takes the body and mind over and you, and that's fine too. You, and then you use. So people need a little bit of help sometimes to kind of navigate this issue, you know, with all the drivers and the unconscious stuff that's behind it. Yeah. And, and that's what your natural rest method is all about. It's you're there to support everyone that needs support and guiding because it's so it's so easy for the mind or the ego to get caught caught up. <laughs> yes, it's so easy. And and yeah, the natural rest is just a way of of talking about allowing everything to be as it is. As we said, just everything comes and everything goes. It's sort of the whole book points to that which is very helpful for addiction. 
just to see that everything comes and goes. A thought of drinking, a thought of not drinking, a feeling, a sensation, everything comes and goes. So natural rest is just the word that I use that describes a full allowing of everything, <laughs> everything coming and going to awareness. And that the when the addiction cycle gets put to rest, that's why I use natural rest, that in that presence, these addictions can come to rest, like naturally. That's why I use that term sometimes. Mm. Yeah. Yeah, it's a it's nice, it's, it sounds very natural, <laughs> very, very relaxing. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Yeah, it's, it's like you're resting from always grabbing on to the thoughts that come up and identifying with them. And you're resting from always uh, identifying with the emotions and the sensations or what. Yeah, it makes sense. Yeah. Yes, yes. Yeah. And uh, in Living Realization, you also mentioned the middle way, which is a very Buddhist term, right? The middle way. And can you explain that? Yeah, the middle way is is like the freedom from extreme viewpoints. So extreme viewpoints in this particular school of Buddhism that I was trained in, Madhyamaka, it just talks about the danger of extremes. So one extreme would be the belief in separation. That's a very extreme view from that perspective, to believe that everything is separate, independent. It's an error. It's not really how things exist. And it's an extreme view. But on the other end of the spectrum can be the view that there is nothing here. Um, almost a denying the appearances or the denying the relativity, the duality. And I think that can be problematic in your everyday life in different ways. So that's an extreme view to say, it can lead to nihilism and purposelessness and other things. So the middle way is the full integration of that as if those two things can exist together without a problem like that there is nothing here and everything is here, relatively speaking, without any tension between the two. There's no tension in the middle way. There's, the mind isn't trying to figure that out. It, doesn't, it isn't puzzled by it. It isn't confused by the fact that these things are both here. It just feels, although paradoxical to the mind, it feels very natural to talk in the middle of the way because it, it acknowledges our relative reality, our conventional reality, doesn't deny it, which I think is practical and helpful. And it helps us. I mean, how else would I have known to come onto the interview today without relative knowledge? So, and then at the same time, is this really an interview? What exists? What are we doing? Who are you? What am I? On the absolute level, there isn't really anything here. <laughs> There's just, you know, but those two things can happen at once without any tension is the point. And I think when they, when you, when they're, when, when they're a lived experience, when that is not a problem for you anymore, I think that you're really at ease in your life because you don't have any of that psychological tension either, like where you're trying to make everything in your mind into non-duality or everything into duality. The two just go, whew, here they are, no tension. Yeah, like also the Buddhist term, form is emptiness and emptiness is form, right? It's, it's, and that is non-duality too, so it's like yeah. one and the same. Yes. Yeah. Yes. And it's true. Yeah, the mind has a tendency to always, well, oh, now, now I get it. Now I'm that. And then I'm not, you know, we always have these opposites and somehow the mind likes to do the, the black and white all the time. Right. <laughs> yeah. Either or. Yeah. 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 Either this or that. That's right. Yeah. And maybe it's just what the mind likes to do, but we are not the mind. We are not what, those thoughts tell us anyway right so it's like okay let it do its thing and let it do it black and white and maybe gray and whatever it's not who i am really it's just popping up right right also the mind can't even think non-dualistically it can't grasp non-dual realization because its very nature is the reason that it functions so well is because it functions within duality you know, it wouldn't, our mind wouldn't function without that very well. In order to know black, we have to know what a white is. We have to understand the difference, the opposites, and how one thing relates to another. So that's what's brilliant about the mind is that it's able to do that. But when it comes to the realization, the mind cannot get this because it still goes to its dualisms. It still tries to say either it's all one and there's no one here or there's everyone, everything here. And it just cannot 
It doesn't know how to hold both of those things. But to our awareness, both of those things are already recognized and held. That's, that's obvious. But to the mind, to thinking mind, there'd be no way for that mind to grasp this fully. Maybe intellectually on some level, but not as a lift experience, the mind can't. Yeah. Right. And that makes me also think of something that I know personally really gets to me. And I don't know if I'll ever understand it. I guess the mind just can't, can't get it, but it's almost, it's like when, for example, murders or Holocaust cost, or um, it can be, you know, ex extreme actions from one human to another that has nothing to do with love. That's just absolutely horrible. Or what you know, it torture, for example. And I, I just cannot understand how it is possible. And because we are made of that unconditional love, that timeless awareness, the presence, um, source, whatever you call it, right? And that that is love. And how out of that can stuff like that happen it is beyond me and i i still no matter what i do i cannot accept something in me and maybe it's because it's that mind that just says no it's it's not right right i don't know what it is or but it feels deeper than the mind it feels like it's beyond the thoughts it feels like something so in it that that is just not love and it's just not right there's something off with this you know I, who knows what would be like humans in the future so let's say hundreds of years from now when we look back at what's happened in history with hitler and all of these folks who you say have done these kind of things i think at one point humanity might look back and say yeah that wasn't right and we were at a different evolutionary stage and we we were not we were unconscious like we were asleep and now we're awake to this and we know that it's not right but until then, there's not much you can do because if you think about it with someone like Hitler or a leader, it's just, it's, it is the dual, it's, an, it's the nature of the dualistic mind to do that. I mean, just like this is my country versus your country or us versus them or me versus you. That's what the mind does. And it's when, it's, when there's an identification with the mind, that's exactly what it does. And it's been doing that for thousands of years, wars, terrorism, murder, rape. Of, of a misperception of who you are. It comes from a misperception of who you are. Like if, if Hitler would have recognized his true nature, we don't know what would have happened, but would he have done what he, he, he did? I have big doubts about that, <laughs> about whether in that recognition, he would have been able to follow through with those plans, but that's not the consciousness that Hitler had. So we have to acknowledge that that's not the consciousness that he has. So for those of us who are waking up out of that consciousness, of course, we're going to see what he's doing as less evolved, less conscious, asleep. Some will call it evil or pain. But from his consciousness, it makes perfect sense, you see. And that's the, that's the tricky thing because he cannot see or he could not see. No one can see beyond the consciousness or the experience that they're having. They cannot. So even if we said to him, if we had Hitler right here and we said, don't you see that there is no ego, that, that there literally there's just this one consciousness even if we said that if his consciousness he would not be able to hear it he can't see it until you can see it and so he's going to have to operate on that so-called lower level of consciousness ego conscious and that's where all the destruction comes from is that separative kind of thing where it's me versus you and us versus them and i think we're going to evolve beyond that we're not close to that yet you know there's some of us who are waking up out of all this but by and large, our whole species is still very much caught in it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and but it's what what happens. That's what that's the thing. It's it's what happens. So, but how can that happen? Even in the first place, like there was no Hitler, there's no Scott, there's no Susan here, right? We are no one, right? And yet we are all this. So, so what happened back then with Hitler and the Holocaust, that's still what happened. And um, so it was this back then, right? But it's just like, uh, 
how is that possible to come out of love? Let, let's say, okay, so Hitler, he was not conscious of his true nature and so on. And, and uh, it, you know, it's, yeah, I, I, I get that. But how is it possible that it arose in the first place that a, as a parent person was not conscious and did that? You know, like it should not even then happen that that could happen. You know what I mean? Yeah, I do. I do. And I've often like pondered that question. Like, why do things like that happen? Or how, why did we develop an ego? Why is there an ego consciousness in the first place? Because it's so destructive and causes so much suffering. And I can't help but think that it did have some evolutionary benefit for us. Like, and when I look at this one, from, for example, for addiction, we were talking about addiction. Like we needed to know where the meat and the berries were. We needed to know that to survive as a species. Our brain needed to be hijacked and to be seeking those things in order to survive. That's an evolutionary thing. And I also think that just that need to survive as an individual, just for evolutionary purposes, is part of the reason why the ego is be, was uh, somehow developed or born because it was a matter of survival that we needed to survive, like pr to protect our tribe, to protect our individual self, but to also protect our tribe against other tribes. So it's helped us survive. And somehow out of that consciousness, we, we got so identified with that, that someone like Hitler can be born <laughs> out of that, you know. Um, but Hitler was not Hitler is not an isolated case. You know, it's like, if you look at history, humans live in ego consciousness. He's just one example of it, but this is our consciousness, you know, up until this point. And so it doesn't surprise me in a consciousness where the whole game is separation. If that's the consciousness where your whole, you actually think in terms of separation, whether it's for survival or what other reason, it isn't surprising to me that things like that happen when your consciousness is coming from separation. Now, when you say love, that's pointing to beyond separation. That's pointing to a recognition that not a lot of people have had yet. And we, I don't think it's, I don't think it's even in some ways fair to assume that Hitler was coming from that because I don't think he was coming from that recognition of, of non-separation. I think he was very much coming from the ego consciousness. Yeah. Yeah. And, and that's what most of us are, and we are just not as extreme as him, right? But it is yeah. that we believe, we deeply believe that we are what we think and we believe and, and um, you know, that we are the emotions and we are this little um, person in this body. And so that's what I like about your books too, because you have a lot of guidance there where you actually take people uh, on a journey where they can experience the truth, the reality of themselves, that that's what they are not. By you, know, you, you um, guide, for example, with, okay, where the wall here, in, is that really a wall if you don't put the word wall onto it, but there's no word and you just look at it and what are the colors on the wall and the shapes and all that, is that if you don't put any words to anything, you can it's not really separate you know you have different ways of pointing uh, so that you can have the direct experience of yeah this. yeah yeah i've always favored that like even when I, so i'm a teacher who does sessions i do one-on-one -on -one sessions i've done that for 15 years like three to five sessions a day and that's because when you're in a group as a teacher you you can give people the direct experience but if you've got 30 people in the room or 50 people in the room with different experiences, you can't always like directly help each person sort of recognize from the place where they're at, you know, but one-on-one -on -one you can. And that's where, so the books contain some of those experiential exercises simply because that's what I do with people one-on-one -on -one, as I'm very much about direct experience. Like, let's stop talking about it. Not, not here, because this is an interview. But what I say to people, okay, once you've read the books and you know the pointers, that's it, you know the pointers. Now let's come, Let's come into direct experience with this. And that's what, to me, that's what it's all about. It's, it's all about direct experience. So that would be the natural thing to talk about. Yeah. Yeah, because that, that's, you, you have to know it uh, and be it to, to, to know it, right? <laughs> like it, it has nothing to do with the, the words we put onto it or the description of it. That's just a description, right? That's right. Yeah. It's just, it's just a realization for sure. 
it's a it's a scene yeah yeah, yeah. and then as you see that and you live that day by day and then it seems like it deepens something does it deep did it deepen to you from the first time you recognized oh i'm not even this person i thought i was i'm just whatever happens and has something happened throughout the years where you kind of is there more clarity or yeah what's yeah your... it, it deepened but it also changed because it deepened in the sense that yeah there's a clear seeing of, of, of no self that never left like the seeing of no self because as i stand here right now and i look for a self immediately i can't there's no seeing i can't find the self like that that has never left so that has remained with me and deepened in the sense of just living on earth and you see that and it, it's such a deep insight to begin with and it just doesn't leave but there's been a deepening in another way which is what i would call embodiment because for me you know it's one thing to recognize that but then the body holds so much of the old stuff you know i don't know if you've noticed that for yourself but like old contractions or pain or emo old emotion repressed emotion so the deepening for me was bringing awareness all the way down into the body and exploring that and then ex and then experiencing a body well you could say that there's no body from the non-dual standpoint but the very experience of the so-called body for me is translucent it's translucent now whereas before i don't think it was as translucent because of the contractions and the different things that were going on so through the years the body has become more and more translucent but another thing that has changed is that the duality the world of duality has is to me not a problem anymore like before that was the whole problem like and i was trying to move out of that hall of mirrors that was so painful into something that i thought would be non-duality but in the end the two become one <laughs> so it's like even the duality isn't is is, is it. it's strange and that's a realization that's very hard to put into words but everything is this, everything isn't. There's nothing that's not, I don't know how to say that. Yeah. So the, yeah, it just, it includes everything. And so that's been the, the deepening is just to see, I guess in one way it's like you stop, what I've been saying is like, you stop having a war against things. You know what I mean? Like your mind just, the dualities collapse over time and your mind where your mind once thought it was this, it just lets go of that, you know what I mean? It just, it's almost like the end of your world, as Adya says, like the end of your your dualistic mind over time. And I think what happened, like for me, was when I was seeking, again, I was trying to get into the non-duality and escape the duality, <laughs> but I had no idea that what was actually going to happen was the non-dual would be recognized and then the dualities perfectly fine within that. And that's been a very surprising realization that I did not see happening because I was so busy trying to escape the duality. I didn't know that it was going to happen, that that would be all fine in the end. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it's like you automatically just accept uh, what is and because you know that is it comes and goes, but also um, that's just reality and there's no you to against it, right? Because you, you're you not even there in the first place. <laughs> uh, a lot of things change in the realization. You know, you don't, you don't experience a lot of the things that you experienced before. Like, I can go on and on, but like <laughs> guilt, shame, grief, all kinds of things that used to just double me over in different ways don't arise anymore some things have arose arisen but as you say they come and go and you see them as they are so yeah yeah and then also by by giving the freedom for all that to arise and play out or whatever then somehow the they dissolve right they dismantle the it's like there's you're not feeding them for to continue coming up somehow that's right that's actually the crux of our inquiries is like we facilitate people we teach them how to inquire on their own and they just learn how to 
to conjure up things, what they believe or their identity or something. And then from there, just allowing it exactly as it is. And then seeing is that it's just coming and going and that they don't, they don't resist it or cling on to it in any way. It just comes and goes and everything is like that in experience. So there's really what our inquiries are, are all about yeah. is that seeing. Yeah. 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 And it's, it's interesting because the biggest addiction is actually the mind. We are all addicted. We are all addicted to the mind, right? Yeah. Un unless you, you, you realize that you're no one <laughs> or recognize it. <laughs> yeah. So it's a huge addiction. And so it is? So, no, go ahead. No, no you, you go ahead. Well, I was just going to say, now that you say that, it's like, it, that is an addiction that I'm very glad isn't here anymore. The addiction to the mind, now that you say that. And maybe that is the primary addiction or one of them. But I, I think I, it's funny, but I don't think you can appreciate how addicted people are or you are until the addiction to the mind falls away. It's like anything, you don't know what you've got till it's gone or something like that. Like you don't see something until it's not there anymore. Then you go, oh, wow, truly addicted to the mind. There's a lot of gratitude for that because most of my life was just completely hooked into my thoughts. So that that's a great addiction to fall away. And I think that's actually an addiction that does start to fall away for a lot of people when they, when they wake up as that addiction to mind for sure. Yeah. And yes, yeah, the whole mind movement, right? And, and yeah. sometimes also speak to people and say, yeah, thoughts, I can see that, but my emotions, yeah, my emotion, I can't just, <laughs> but it's all in, it's like a loop, right? Because it's like the thoughts are attached to the emotions, emotion to it's, it's, and yeah. it's all welded together as you also speak about in your books. Right. And, and, yeah. and that whole welding of all that is like, what makes me feel like, there's a person here yeah yeah um what we've learned through this work is that every thought has a feeling or a sensory tone to it like a feeling or a sensation to it and we've taken that pretty deeply because even when it comes to chronic pain i don't know if you've heard about chronic pain work we're doing but some forms of chronic pain are still emotional and psychological and yeah they're being treated as physical but as you go into inquiry with us what you find out is like that your pain, for example, is connected to thoughts. And as you pull those thoughts up and those thoughts, you see those are not you and those thoughts fall away, your pain starts to shift. So the body, so yeah, it's all connected. And that's the beauty of it too, because then like even things that are seemingly physical, not everything, but things that, se that are seemingly physical or they can even shift, not everything, but things like that can shift because of this connection between them the mind and the body. And I think that's great news because after the realization happened in my life, what I noticed is that my body was still contracted in a certain areas. It just hadn't gone all the way down. And by doing this work, um, I was able to go into those contractions and to see that there were old thoughts connected to them, you know? And thank God that was like that because once I saw those old thoughts come up and the thoughts would fall away, then the contraction would shift. Thank God, because if that wasn't the case, then there would be no way for us to deal with this contracted body after or during recognition. We would just be stuck with this body. We'd have this awakening experience, but this body would feel contracted. So luckily it's all connected so that when we do investigate the mind, there can be eventually a shift. That's what I call embodiment on that level. The somatic level can actually start to feel different. And I don't know why people don't talk about this more. This, I, this embodiment thing, like I know it's not always popular, but it's it's definitely a phenomenon that I notice <laughs> happening for people. So I'm glad that you, you're at least open to talk about it and so that your viewers can hear someone talking about the embodiment piece. Yeah. Yeah, um, yeah and uh, yeah, like chronic, uh, I know a little bit about that too, actually. So yeah, it is all connected. Body, yeah. mind, everything. Yeah. It is. I mean, you know, that's not to say that all, I don't want to put out this idea that through inquiry or non dualization, you can heal every physical thing. I don't know that we know that, but 
there's a lot of healing that can take place in this realization if you remain open. That's what I've learned. A lot of healing can happen for sure. Yeah. Yeah. And and open. I, I like that word a lot. It's like, yeah, just be open. Be open yeah. to experience. <laughs> yeah. 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 Be open. There's so much more we can say about that, but that's just generally a good attitude to have around this work is to remain open because even if you have a recognition, it's very easy to think of what you've realized as the whole thing, right? Like Adi Ashanti talks about this is really what you've realized is just one prism on the on the whole gem he talks about. I don't know what the diamond actually. He says you've only realized one facet of it. But if you remain open, you begin to see more and more there's more realizations more insights and more healing more embodiment that can happen if you remain open but there are, there are folks who for whatever reason they don't remain open and <laughs> you can suffer that way too because if you hold tight to anything on this earth anything anything at all even a spiritual insight you are in some ways setting yourself up for some suffering because nothing is permanent and nothing is ultimately real even our greatest insights. And that's the thing I think people struggle with because they have an insider realization. They want to go, oh, I got it. You don't have anything. You've got an experience that may have shifted something, but that's going to go too. And nothing that you say and nothing that you experience is going to last. And if you see that, then that's, that's freedom and that's openness to see that constantly. But if you hold on to something, trying to make something permanent again, trying to have knowledge that you think, you know, then that's where I think people are going to suffer. So openness is a big topic, actually, for me, is to remain open. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, because it can, your mind, again, is grasping on to just a, another reality that it thinks, it believes in, yeah. or that it think it knows, or it experienced, or, yeah, it's interesting. How yeah. It's very tricky, and it'll, yeah, so... Well, yeah, I mean, it's a real thing because after the realization, I, I had been listening to the teaching so much that the recognition was there, like, clearly, but the mind was still going with its programming, like, still telling me these pointers. And it was like, hold on, these pointers are not necessary anymore. It's been realized, but the mind was still because it was in its program. And that's when I realized, one of the first times I realized is that no matter how profound your mind produces or how profound the thought is, it's all programming in the end. You got to let it go because otherwise you know, you're, you're going to walk around and now your new story is non-duality. That's your new story. <laughs> and that's about, that's about as limiting as anything else. It's a better story, but the direct realization, when you live in the direct realization of that, you don't actually need the, the pointers that much anymore. You don't need that safety net, you know, and that's what I'm trying to help people with is just to let go, let go of all this. These pointers that have helped you have helped you. Once it's recognized, let, let it go. Let it go. All of it. And that's what I mean by, by remaining open. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah because then it, it is that unknown and open and whatever is the direct experience because you're not right. describing all the time and trying to put it into a system or something in your mind to, to grasp, right? It's just, and yeah, there's not a new identity being formed if you just, oh, this is arising, this is arising, this is arising. But it's just uh, experience or insights or whatever, but it's not who you are either. Nothing is who you are, right? It's like, <laughs> yeah. yeah. That's the funny thing about it, because we, non-dual teachers are some of the most prolific they write more books than almost anyone. And yet nothing that you can say about this is ultimately true. <laughs> so it's a bunch of books that are doing their best to describe a realization. But in the end, anything that you say about it is so elusive, it's so illusory, but we still talk about it for sure. It's yeah. just funny. Yeah, but that, that's how we communicate with one another. Yeah. So we use words, right? And you can speak, you can write, but it's words, and it, but it's still words. It's not it, but it's still very helpful. Like, I have no idea how I would ever, you know, known about myself. Well, well, we all know it as little kids, but then we, we, 
we kind of lose it when we learn words, right? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so it's like, then we learned all these words and then now all these words can be helpful to, so we can see who we, you know, it's funny, but. Well, yeah. Yeah, I know it is helpful. The communication is helpful. The teachings are helpful for sure. Uh, I would never have known about non-duality without the books, without the communication, the words. But farther along, when you've already learned about that, what we're talking about is the degree to which we're still holding on to our worldviews and our, you know, even Advaita Vedanta says the teaching, I think it says is illusion too, or, or even Maya, or, or everything is illusion, even the teaching, I will say. And that's, I think, what we're pointing to is later on, and we, we, we let go of that, which, is, which drew us to this in the beginning. And we start living in the direct experience more rather than in the program of it, the teaching. Yeah. 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 It'll take you there and then you can let go, right? It's and and live. Yeah. 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 It's, that's, uh, yeah. Wow. It was, it was wonderful to speak with you, Scott. And yeah. So thanks so for having me. Information. Thank you. Yeah. And your website. So people. Oh, yeah. So killaby.com is the website. We're training a lot of people in the Killaby inquiries right now that are helping people all over the world. If you're interested in becoming a, a facilitator, killaby.com is your place. But we also have treatment centers here in the Palm Springs. I want to tell people about that. So we're the first non dual mindfulness based treatment centers in the US. We have two centers here one's the Killaby Center for Recovery. The other is the Natural Rest House. You can find those centers at killabycenter.com. Yeah. Great. And uh, yeah, I can definitely recommend your books, that's for sure. And thank you for, for taking your time and uh, yeah, participating. Yeah, my pleasure. Yeah. Okay. Thank you.